everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. This is Dee Miles, and I will be one of the moderators uh, for tonight's uh, uh, class. Uh, we are joined uh, by a second moderator tonight, uh, Scott Hiley, uh, who will help to uh, steer the class as directed by our, uh, our facilitator, our, our teacher, Carl Wood. Uh, and so we should uh, have a very uh, uh, inspiring and, and uh, educational uh, evening or experience uh, this evening. So without uh, much more, uh, I'll turn uh, the, the mic over to uh, Scott Hiley. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, registering and uh, attending tonight's session of, of the Marxist classes. And uh, we're really happy to have the occasion to delve into the history of the Communist Party USA and the US labor movement. Um, we're gonna take things a little bit slow here at the beginning just to give people a chance to come on. Um, for those of us who have, for those of you who haven't participated uh, in one of our classes before, uh, a special welcome. And um, we hope there's gonna be a lot of questions and discussion. If you have a question, you can uh, click the uh, raised hand icon in your GoToWebinar control panel, uh, and that'll show us uh, that you have a, uh, a question. Um, and uh, we will be able to, uh, we will be able to uh, call on you there. Um, uh, and I think with that, we're going to ask Carl to maybe tell us a little about himself and his history in the labor movement. Good evening, Scott, Dee, and everybody who's on this webinar. Uh, my name's Carl Wood. Uh, I come out of a progressive working class family. I grew up in Baltimore, and uh, after my father was fired from his job in the steel mill uh, for being a communist, um, our family moved to California, which is where I live today. Uh, in the course of my life, I've uh, spent most of the time uh, working in uh, mostly union shops, uh, some non-union shops, and uh, have been active in the labor movement in various capacities. Uh, I worked in the steel in industry in Indiana and in California for 10 years. Uh, I uh, became a member, then shop steward, and worked my way up to uh, head of a 2000 member local of the Utility Workers Union of America, and uh, also went on the National Executive Board uh, of that union. Uh, in the, uh, at the uh, 1999, I was appointed by uh, the governor of California to the State Public Utilities Commission uh, at the request of the unions in the utility industry. And I served there for six years during the infamous energy crisis that's uh, often associated with the name Enron. Um, after that tour of duty, I uh, did consulting for a number of unions, went back to work for the utility workers as a national representative, and then retired two years ago. Uh, that's a little bit about my background. Uh, like any person who gets to this age, uh, I have a lot of other experiences, but everybody else does too. Um, with that, I'm going to kick it back to Scott and uh, see when he wants me to start the presentation. Uh, I think we're ready. Um, we're we're coming up on 8:05 here, um, so let's uh, let's take it away. Um, thanks very much for introducing yourself, and I can't wait to hear what you have for us. Great. Um, I'm going to uh, try to keep my initial presentation down to uh, 45 minutes so that we have plenty of time for comments and questions from uh, people who have joined in here. Uh, I'm gonna be covering a lot of territory. The theme of this presentation, after all, is the Communist Party USA and the labor movement in the centennial year of the Communist Party. Uh, the party was founded in 1919. It's been 100 years. There's a lot that happened during that period of time, and I'm going to have to uh, a little bit rush through it. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to cover that and plenty of time for interaction with those of you who are on this call. 
from the moment of its inception in 1919, the Communist Party's history has been deeply entwined with that of the US labor movement. Under the leadership of great working class leaders, uh, such as William Z. Foster, uh, the party struggled successfully to free itself and the labor movement in the US of the sectarian ideology of dual unionism, which had held back progressive forces from overcoming the narrow conservative craft unionism and from organizing the millions of workers in uh, the mass production industries, especially into industrial unions. Providing unique leadership to the movement for industrial unionism, the Communist Party fought for and implemented the slogan, black and white, unite and fight, as well as demands for the full inclusion and equality of women in the labor movement. As an organization rooted in immigrant and immigrant communities, the party advanced demands for the protection of the foreign born. And it was communist efforts to organize the unemployed that laid the groundwork for broad working class unity, leading to the building of the CIO and the growth of the AFL. Often overlooked is the communist party's role in infusing many of the new CIO unions with the hyper democratic principles it inherited from the industrial workers of the world, uh, the IWW and other pioneering labor organizations. Uh, briefly, uh, unions have existed in the United States since the 1820s. Uh, but in the, in the early part of the 19th century, workers were mostly in small shops or worked as individuals. Uh, largely, they were skilled or semi-skilled workers or apprentices and uh, joined together in unions that didn't really represent large shops the way we know them today. Uh, they, the establishment of central labor councils began in the late 1830s and with the influx of millions of Irish and German immigrants between 1820 and 1860, including uh, a number of Marxists who uh, came to the United States after the defeat of the revolutionary upsurge in Europe in 1848. Uh, those immigrants frequently brought with them revolutionary and Marxist ideas. Uh, there was a series of national labor organizations, the National Labor Union from 1868 to 1876, the Knights of Labor from 1878 to 1893, and uh, then the American Federation of Labor, or as we generally know it now, uh, the AFL, uh, which was founded in 1886. The AFL was made up of, uh, of, craft, wor of craft workers for the most part. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, however, there were also uh, efforts made to organize people on a broader level uh, by industry and without the restrictions that characterize the AFL. Notable among those was uh, the IWW, which I mentioned earlier. There were also a number of socialist groups established in the United States, uh, which preceded the Communist Party. The Socialist Labor Party was founded in 1886, which was Marxist, but highly dogmatic and rejected the economic trade union struggle in favor of the idea of what they called socialist industrial unionism. And the conquest of, the power, of, the, of power uh, exclusively by the ballot. Uh, the Socialist Party in the United States was founded in 1898 it was it had both reformist and revolutionary wings. Uh, as was true of the socialist movement around the world, uh, it began to split between those two un, uh, wings. Uh, the split in the United States began in 1912 and was uh, really finalized or consummated during and after World War One. The uh, I'm gonna talk mostly though, not about those organizations except for the A AFL, because that brings us into the period of the 20th century and particularly the period during which the Communist Party was founded. The problems of the approach that the AFL characterized was first of all, it restricted its membership and organizing to skilled, mostly native born white male workers. Uh, most AFL unions excluded women, they excluded African-American uh, workers, 
uh, they frequently excluded non-English speaking and other foreign born workers. Uh, it tended to be uh, and become as time went on very bureaucratic and anti-democratic and was dominated by full-time business agents. Uh, often the union locals and even the national organizations uh, became corrupt, gangster ridden and uh, in, in alliance or even dominated by bosses. Uh, the AFL rejected the idea of organizing workers by industry uh, because that would have meant bringing in the uh, very many uh, less skilled workers who were coming into the mass production industries. Uh, the AFL was only interested in organizing the highly skilled craft workers who, as I said before, tended to be English speaking white males. Uh, during this time, uh, most workers uh, were now non-craft employees working in mass production industries, which were dominated not by local uh, rich people or millionaires, but by uh, trusts and other monopolies. Um, and as I said before, the AFL, uh, for the most part, uh, almost totally excluded African-Americans, the foreign born and women. Disgust with this approach among militant workers gave rise uh, to the idea of dual unionism, which meant uh, that you would set up progressive unions alongside and in competition with the established AFL unions. Uh, it rejected work within the AFL uh, to bring the workers in those unions around to a, a broader and industrial point of view. Um, also, uh, what became an important uh, trend in, uh, in this period was the idea of syndicalism, which rejected political work in favor of direct union action. Uh, real syndicalists held that uh, society should be organized not based on the political order, but rather society should be run at every level by workers organized in their unions. Despite the narrow approach of the AFL, uh, important strikes took place uh, during the late 1800s and into the early 1900s uh, in the railroads. Uh, the name Eugene Debs, the great railroad union leader, comes up uh, as one of our real heroes of, uh, of labor history, as well as the socialist movement. In steel, uh, the Homestead strike in the early uh, 1890s, a uh, very violent uh, strike which was ruthlessly crushed by the steel trust, uh, in metal mining, particularly in the in the Southwest, uh, but there was very little permanent success, except uh, to some degree in coal mining and in some of the garment-related industries. Uh, William Z. Foster, uh, who was one of the founding members of the IWW, uh, came to uh, by, reject the idea of syndicalism and uh, was inspired by, and, and also of dual unionism, and was inspired by the French syndicalist model of what they called boring from within uh, the conservative craft unions. <clears throat> uh, he organized a group called the Syndicalist League of North America, which, uh, which put out propaganda, did some organizing, but did not really become a, a mass organization of workers. Um, however, the Syndicalist League disregarded the need for a revolutionary political party and for political action. Uh, Foster had not come around to that point of view yet. The U.S. entry into World War I in 1917 created conditions conducive to organizing in the key industries, a fact that was now recognized by Foster. Uh, the Chicago Meatpacking organizi Organizing Campaign in 1917 was uh, led by Foster and the Chicago Federation of Labor, which was the Chicago affiliate of the AFL, uh, with the reluctant acquiescence of the AFL leadership. Um, the, the name Foster keeps coming up here, and I'm, I made a deliberate effort not to be dropping a lot of other names, but uh, he played an absolutely key role in the laying the groundwork for industrial organization in the United States and later in founding and leading the American Communist Party. Uh, that 
meatpacking organizing drive successfully organized more than 200,000 black and white workers in the Chicago area and beat the highly trustified industry despite the uh, betrayals and intentional sabotage by the AFL leadership, which was afraid of the consequences of having a large union membership, which did not reflect the, the style and the makeup that their unions uh, had at that time. Uh, Foster and the Chicago Federation of Labor, led by uh, a progressive uh, AFL leader, uh, John Fitzpatrick, who was the head of the uh, CFL, the Chicago Federation of Labor, um, followed up this, this meatpacking campaign uh, with an effort to organize the steel industry. While formally endorsed by the AFL leadership, uh, they stalled the organizing drive until the end of World War I, during which the workers had the maximum leverage on the steel companies because of the steel demands of the war. And uh, the strike didn't begin until 1919. Uh, however, uh, despite uh, the lack of, of funding from the established unions and uh, continuing sabotage by the AFL leadership and, of course, uh, vociferous opposition by the companies and by the government at every level, the federal level, the state and local levels, uh, 350,000 workers struck. And uh, in the ensuing three and a half months, uh, important parts of the country, uh, Northern Indiana, for example, Gary, uh, a large part of Western Pennsylvania and other steel producing areas uh, were put under martial law in order to suppress the strike. 22 people were killed, but after three and a half months, the strike was defeated. Uh, World War I precipitated uh, a split in the international socialist movement, including in the United States. The left wing in most countries identifying with the successful Russian revolution called themselves communists. The right wing kept the old socialist name. The left wing of the US socialists were organized into two groups, which initially formed two communist parties, the Communist Labor Party of America or CPLA, which was made up largely of US born and other English speaking workers and the Communist Party of America, uh, CPA, which was composed mostly, not exclusively, of members of language federations, uh, Germans, Hungarians, Latvians, Lithuanians, Poles, uh, Ukrainians, Russians, and others, uh, because a large part of the immigrant population uh, did not speak uh, each other's language. And uh, the only way that these workers could effectively be organized was through language federations. In May of 1920, the two parties merged into the United Communist Party of America. So we say that 1919, which is when the two parties were uh, were founded, I, th I think it was at the end of August, beginning of September, uh, is the beginning of uh, our the centenary, which we're observing. Uh, but the formal merger took place a year later in May of 1920. Many members of the new Communist Party came out of the, the dual union Socialist Party left wing and the dual union syndicalist movements like the IWW, uh, including iconic leaders like Big Bill Haywood, John Reed, uh, the author of the famous uh, book, 10 Days That Shook the World, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn and Foster, who would be closely associated with the new party work and labor through the coming decades. A unique feature of the new party was its commitment to full social, economic, and political equality for African Americans, which distinguished it from every other political organization in the nation. Uh, this was quite a, a quite a shift, quite a breakthrough for any uh, organization, which is the Communist Party was at that time predominantly white. Um, and uh, did not happen without uh, the necessity of considerable struggle internally, but especially with other forces uh, in the labor movement and outside and antagonistic to the labor movement who uh, 
did not appreciate uh, the effort to bring whites and blacks together for mutual help and struggle. The creation of this new party, coupled with the revolutionary surge in Europe uh, right after World War I and the wave of militant strike activity uh, in the United States, led the panicky US ruling class to react with savage repression, including the infamous Palmer Raids. That's where J. Edgar Hoover got his start uh, in 1919. And during those raids, over 10,000 suspected radicals, mostly immigrants, were arrested uh, frequently without any uh, legal niceties or uh, warrants. And over 500 of them were deported. Um, Despite the new party's formal rejection of syndicalism and dual unionism, the stubborn resistance of the conservative and often corrupt AFL leadership drove many on the left, including communists, to fail to fully embrace, embrace the new approach during the 1920s. Uh, Foster pushed hard within the party and, within, and throughout the labor movement uh, to overcome this resistance to uh, a uh, approach of, of working in a united way within the existing unions. Uh, he organized a group called the uh, Trade Union Education League, TUEL, uh, which later was uh, changed to Trade Union Unity League uh, to promote the approach of working within the conservative unions. Uh, this was a struggle which had to be continued through the 1920s because the roots of this uh, dual unionism were very deep among radicals in the working class. Uh, and that, of course, was constantly being reinforced by the refusal of the conservative AFL leadership to have anything to do with, uh, with workers that were not their own members, uh, that didn't represent this narrow group of workers that historically had made up the AFL. Uh, during this period, the 1920s, despite the appearance of prosperity, high rates of unemployment, uh, vicious company resistance, official repression, and sabotage by AFL officialdom led to a decade of stagnation and defeats for labor, despite a number of heroic and militant strikes. Uh, labor uh, did not grow during this period. In fact, uh, the ranks of the organized shrunk. Uh, however, in contrast to the platitudes of the bourgeois parties and the AFL bureaucrats, the Communist Party recognized that this prosperity was a bubble. And when it burst uh, on, in October 1929, the Communist Party, despite its small numbers, which at that time was less than 10,000, was prepared to give leadership. The biggest obstacles to biggest obstacle to winning strikes in the preceding decades had always been the ability of employers to recruit scabs from the des desperate army of unemployed. Uh, even during the best of times, there were millions of workers who needed jobs and were unable to find them. Uh, this was a time when there was no unemployment insurance, uh, there was no welfare system as we know it today, uh, although. I won't say that there's a whole lot of one today, but uh, the position of unemployed people was quite desperate. And when there was a strike, uh, the employers had the ability to recruit scabs from the desperate armies of unemployed. However, with the outbreak of the Great Depression in 1929, that army had grown to one third of the workforce. And the Communist Party focused its efforts on a class approach to organizing workers. That is not only organizing workers within a particular craft or within a, even uh, within particular workshops or industries, but rather to organizing working class people as a class, uh, both the employed and the unemployed. The party focused on organizing the unemployed to demand immediate relief from unemployment, from starvation, and from homelessness. This uh, took many forms. Uh, sometimes it uh, took the form of very militant uh, local actions which, uh, in which uh, communists uh, displayed a contempt for the niceties of bourgeois property rights when 
uh, renters and tenants were evicted from their homes, communists organized in neighborhoods to uh, take their furniture that had been thrown out on the street by the sheriff evicting them and moving it back into their homes. Uh, in the farms, in the rural areas, uh, communists and other progressives organized efforts to uh, physically block the auctioning of uh, foreclosed farms and prevent the uh, further impoverishment of thousands and thousands of farmers throughout rural United States. Uh, the, um, in, in the very depths of the Great Depression, the party and other progressive forces organized hunger marches and other militant actions at the national and local levels. Uh, these included the famous uh, bonus march uh, at the beginning of the 1930s on Washington, which was uh, an effort by uh, veterans of World War I to claim the bonus that had been promised them at the end of the war. Uh, it was going, to, it was supposed to be paid at the end of the 1940s. Uh, they were demanding that it be paid now so that they could they could eat and return to uh, be, being uh, in homes and houses. Uh, the success of these efforts in bringing into active struggle millions of the unemployed laid the groundwork for the successful drives for unionization of the mass production industries in the 1930s and 1940s. The Communist Party's class approach to organizing, especially its focus on fighting for the full equality of African-American workers, of women, and of immigrants, was the key to preventing fatal splits in the ranks of labor as the organizing drives unfold, unfolded. Uh, if I were to put uh, my finger on a single uh, contribution that uh, the party made, uh, during all of this period, uh, and there were many contributions. It was precisely this class approach that re recognized the fact that the unemployed were workers too, and that organizing the working class necessitated organizing the unemployed as well as the unemployed. Uh, the upsurge of activity within the working class and uh, discontent throughout the population led to political changes. The uh, Republican Party was thrown out of the presidency in 1932. And uh, in the congressional elections in 1934 and, uh, and in 1936, the Democratic Party, which uh, had begun to respond in some ways to uh, the demands for relief by the working class, uh, scored tremendous gains. And of course, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, who was initially elected in 1932 and took office in 1933 after uh, an approach uh, that went in different directions at first, that was rather uncertain. Uh, with the pressure from down below, from uh, the workers and from uh, progressives organized within the left movements, including the Communist Party, uh, Roosevelt moved to the left in his programs so that by the mid-1930s, uh, the Congress began to pass uh, important progressive legislation. Uh, the Wagner Act, or National Labor Relations Act, uh, granted for the first time the uh, clear legal right of workers to be represented by unions and established processes for that to happen. Uh, the uh, needs of people who were unemployed and starving uh, were met by government programs to put people to work, uh, as well as uh, the establishment of the social security system, which provided for old age and disability pensions. Uh, as well as establishing unemployment insurance in, uh, at the federal and, and in the states. Uh, during this period, the uh, limitations of the AFL became more and more glaring. Some of the unions within the AFL, uh, especially the ones that were already industrial or semi-industrial in character, in particular, I have in mind the mine workers union, the coal miners union, and uh, the uh, unions in the garment industry. Uh, the uh, 
recognized that they could not continue to exist unless efforts were made to organize workers in all of the mass production industries, uh, especially the ones that were heavily trustified like uh, steel and other metals, the uh, auto industry, rubber, uh, and, uh, and uh, marine workers, uh, as well as uh, focusing on farm workers and sharecroppers, especially in the South and in the West. When, uh, when these unions and union leaders attempted to develop a committee on industrial organization within the AFL, uh, they were uh, barred from this activity by the AFL leadership. And uh, when they defied the ban, uh, ultimately they were kicked out of the AFL and established a separate organization to be called the Congress of Industrial Organizations, which we know as the CIO. Um, the, uh, the, the communists played a tremendously important role in the uh, efforts of the CIO to organize workers throughout all of the industries. Uh, coming out of the union building campaigns of the 1930s and the 1940s, communists were widely recognized as the most committed and principled unionists, often op occupying positions of leadership at the local, regional, and sometimes national levels. Uh, it's, I think, typical or characteristic, perhaps, that when uh, the uh, that when the CIO uh, established a steelworkers organizing committee under the leadership of mine workers vice president Philip Murray, uh, the organizing committee hired 200 uh, original organizers. Of those 200, uh, 60 of them were that is 30 percent were members of the Communist Party. Uh, they didn't enter this position surreptitiously. They were uh, recruited by the CIO leadership, recognizing the uh, commitment and ability and courage that communist organizers had shown throughout industry and throughout the history of organizing in the United States. Um, the, uh, the same story in, in different forms uh, took place in all of these different mass production industries, uh, which I previously mentioned. Auto uh, was a very important one. The rubber industry, electrical equipment, marine workers with the establishment of uh, uh, Longshoremen's Union on the West Coast, the ILWU, uh, the National Maritime Union, Union of, of Merchant Seamen. Hold on a minute, Carl. Okay, someone's mic is open. I don't know how that happened, but if you are on uh, the, or if you are participating in the class, be you on the phone or on the computer, make sure your mic is closed. If you're not, Carl would. Excuse me, Carl. Okay, thank you, Dee. Um, it would take a lot longer than uh, the time that I'm going to spend here tonight uh, to get into any detail at all on the incredible and tremendous contributions that were made to the organization of the CIO and, in fact, the uh, organization of the AFL during this period of the 1930s and 40s. But uh, suffice it to say that uh, the communists were universally recognized as uh, key actors uh, and, and selfless participants in the struggle for labor rights. The, um, however, uh, and, and during this time, uh, seeing the huge successes of the CIO, the AFL was forced to reconsider its position and to commit itself to industrial organization. So while it remained primarily a union of craft workers, uh, it expanded into industrial organization in various areas while trying to keep the same conservative approach to building unions that it had had before. At the end of World War II, uh, U.S. imperialism emerged as the dominant economic power in the world and began to focus its energy not uh, on defeating fascism, that had been accomplished already, uh, or so we thought, um, 
and focused its energies on the twin goals of first destroying its wartime ally, the Soviet Union, and as well suppressing the unwelcome militancy of the U.S. working class, which threatened the profits of the U.S. monopolies. The Taft-Hartley Act, uh, which was a comprehensive anti-union law, uh, which repealed many of the union protections that were included in the Wagner Act, was passed in 1947. Uh, one of the most pernicious uh, parts of that law was the requirement that to be uh, to exercise their privileges under the uh, federal labor law, unions had to ensure that all of their officers uh, signed an anti-communist oath. This is a way of forcing the unions themselves to purge themselves of communist leaders. Also during this period, uh, the uh, the CIO uh, as an organization was split between those who wanted to resist this, this approach and those who capitulated. Uh, the, the capitulation didn't just happen completely voluntarily. The, the unions were threatened that if they didn't go along with this, uh, that they would be effectively made illegal and banned. And uh, as a result, uh, the CIO demanded that all of its constituent unions expel uh, communists from leadership. Those unions, uh, which included a number of the largest of them and the most important and certainly the most militant, that refused to do so were expelled from the CIO. Further during this period, uh, the pr prosecution uh, began of communist leaders under the Smith Act which uh, made it a crime to conspire to teach or advocate the violent overthrow of the government. What this meant in practice, uh, and I know this from some personal history, my uncle was one of the Smith Act victims who uh, spent three years in federal prison for uh, conducting classes uh, in which he uh, used texts such as Lenin's State and Revolution, which it was represented in court, uh, called for the overthrow of the U.S. government. That was the crime that people were, were uh, accused of. That was the crime of which they were convicted. And uh, this led to the jailing of uh, first dozens and then uh, many more Communist Party leaders, first at the highest level, at the national level, and then uh, in various districts at the district and local levels. Uh, along with this, the uh, House and American Activities Committee, at the behest of the industries, held hearings uh, in which they anointed company uh, informants as uh, as uh, FBI agents. Uh, they hadn't been FBI agents, but they were ca called FBI agents for the purpose of testifying before the committee. Uh, they uh, listed the names of members, uh, alleged members of the Communist Party, and those alleged members were then subpoenaed before the committee and uh, required uh, under penalty of perjury to uh, first of all, uh, affirm that they were members of the Communist Party and then to name the names of other people they knew who were members of the Communist Party. Uh, everybody knows, or I, maybe not everybody, but uh, it's widely known uh, about the famous Hollywood 10. Those were 10 uh, screenwriters and directors uh, from Hollywood who were some of the earliest victims of the House Un-American Activities Committee, they invoked their right not to name names under the First Amendment. Uh, the courts held that that wasn't sufficient to protect them, and they were sent to prison for their refusal to, uh, to name names. Uh, following that, uh, the committee held hearings uh, in city after city, mostly places where uh, the CIO had been successful in uh, organizing unions and uh, called up uh, literally hundreds of accused communists from various industries. Uh, this led to the firing of those people after they uh, invoked the Fifth Amendment to refuse to uh, 
incriminate themselves as a way of avoiding having to name the names of their fellow workers. Uh, the firings uh, also uh, led to blacklisting of those employees and uh, the effect of it was to rob these unions uh, of some of their most effective uh, rank and file leaders. Um, this uh, led to a very, very difficult period uh, coming out of, uh, of the late 40s and into the 50s. Um, and that uh, pressure, that tremendous pressure uh, and uh, government persecution also led to a fair amount of disarray and even factional struggles within the Communist Party, uh, so that its effectiveness was severely uh, reduced during the 1950s. However, with the upsurge of uh, particularly of the civil rights movement in the late 1950s and the early 1960s, as well as the emergence of a strong peace movement, uh, the uh, some resurgence, limited resurgence in the labor movement, uh, the political mood in the country began to change. Uh, and so we saw an end to what we now refer to as the McCarthy period and the beginnings of uh, some new winds uh, sweeping through the political uh, life of the United States. The party uh, took every effort uh, to reorganize itself and, uh, and focused again, uh, as it had from the very beginning, on the labor movement, on working within the working class. Uh, it perceived that the existing unions as a result of the, these attacks from uh, big business and from the government uh, had, uh, had lost a lot of their uh, effective leadership and had become much more conservative, often corrupt, so that even the CIO unions began to resemble the old AFL. The party, uh, put forward the idea that uh, the change had to come from the bottom. It had to come from organizing workers uh, for the struggle for their day-to-day -day needs uh, to strengthen the labor movement. Uh, to that end, uh, it advocated building a rank and file movement, um, formed, uh, helped to form uh, an organization called Trade Unionists for Action and Democracy, or TUAD, uh, and published a publication called Labor Today, which advocated uh, rank and file struggles to uh, advance the interests of the workers. Uh, this was particularly important in the steel, the auto, and uh, the machinist industry. Um, the Party Labor Commission worked with uh, comrades and unions to help build new forms within the labor movement, including the uh, uh, coalition of Black Trade Unionists, or CBTU, uh, the Coalition of Labor Union Women, or CLU, uh, the uh, LACLA, which uh, organized uh, Latino workers uh, as, as a caucus within the labor movement, and some district or local uh, efforts. One very important one was the uh, Steelworkers District 31 Women's Caucus, uh, which played an important role in many struggles. Uh, the Party Labor Commission helped to coordinate the work of members throughout the country who worked in the same industries and unions, farm workers, uh, public employees in unions like AFSCME and SEIU, uh, and Longshore in the mine workers in steel and other industries. Uh, the party continued to circulate its newspapers, uh, the Daily Worker, uh, the People's World in the West, and later the National People's Weekly World and other party materials to support a broad range of progressive class struggle trade unionism, uh, mobilizing support for strikes and other solidarity actions. Uh, important among these were support for the Piston coal strike in 1989 to 1990. Uh, the party helped to organize strike support around the country, uh, food and clothing caravans and uh, notably press coverage in the daily uh, world um, uh, during the Pittston strike of the three reporters who were allowed within the mine while it was under siege by company forces. Two of those reporters were from the daily world. Uh, the party helped to organize or helped uh, support the organizing drive at Smithfield Ham in Tar Heel, 
North uh, North Carolina in 19 that uh, a long campaign that went from 1993 to 2008 and was ultimately successful. Um, more recently, uh, the downward pressure on wages and working conditions have led to an increase in militancy in the U.S. working class. The emergence of a new generation of leaders is less affected today by anti-communism, and the election of John Sweeney to head the FLCIO in 1995, uh, which was an outgrowth in many respects of this push for a rank-and-file movement, uh, has led to uh, a smaller but more militant labor movement being developed. U.S. communists and their party continue to play a vital role in the movement's revival and growth. And with that, I can't believe it. I We actually finished um, 45 minutes from the start of this, and I think that gives us some time to open up for your comments and questions. Um, I've also uh, asked uh, Scott Marshall, who uh, is a former uh, chair of the Communist Party's National Labor Commission, uh, to assist me in answering some of the questions if something comes up that he feels that he has some particular uh, expertise uh, to address. With that, uh, I will hand it back to the moderator. All right. Uh, thank you, Carl. Um, so we have uh, about 15 minutes for questions. Uh, Comrades, uh, I'm going to ask you to uh, keep your questions um, on the questions and comments on the the brief side, if if possible, to make sure we uh, can uh, fit everybody in. We're going to take questions a few at a time, and then uh, have Carl and uh, Scott uh, respond to them, maybe uh, you know in groups. Um, so our first, we have questions from. Uh, Esther Moroz, uh, Matt Helm, and Lowell Denny that we'll start with. Uh, uh, oh. Okay, so I've, 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 I've got it. I'll help you. I'll help you. Okay. Esther, Esther you're, you're like. <laughs> Yeah, Esther, your mic is open. I, I know he mentioned I had a question, but I don't know how we got that information. Because your raised hand, uh, the rate, the picture of your raised hand. So we'll just close it. Oh, and, can yeah. I put that off? How do I put it off? We'll, we'll click it off. Don't worry. Who's the next person, Scott? Uh, Matt Helm. Uh, Matt. Your mic is open. Oh, uh, so uh, how do I do this? Uh, your your mic is open and we can hear you. So just uh, give us your uh, question or comment. Oh, you guys can hear me. I yep. was wondering about the history of the party and the labor movement in the 60s and 70s, because not a lot is known about that time period. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and then we're going to take a question from uh, Lowell Denny as well. And then we'll uh, go back to Carl to, to answer. Uh, Lowell, your mic is open. Aloha, Carl. Um, aloha, everyone. Um, my question, I'll keep it on the brief side. I had occasion to read my union's constitution recently, uh, pertaining to an incident that I'm involved with. And I came to a section. Um, on offenses, offenses, trials, and penalties. And I was surprised to find that one of the charges that will get me expelled from my union is being a member or supporter of a communist party. So my question, and this recent constitution was ratified in 2015, um, and I work for AFGE, a government union. So my question, Carl, or anyone, is do you know of any other contemporary labor constitutions that still have this language in it? And two, do you believe that it's legal? Thank you. All right, uh, Carl, do you want to sure. take those questions? Yeah, the, uh, the, the first 
question that Matt had about what was the party doing in the 60s and the 70s, uh, this was very much, uh, especially the 60s, was a period of, of rebuilding uh, because the party had, uh, as organization, had been largely wiped out of the labor movement. Uh, although as the 60s developed, uh, it increasingly became an important factor in the civil rights movement and in the uh, peace movement, especially the struggle against the war in Vietnam. Uh, this bled over into the labor movement, and uh, I mentioned a couple of the uh, of the struggles that uh, that the party uh, had been involved with uh, after that um, in the particularly in the 80s. But the groundwork was really laid by the uh, the efforts of uh, to build these rank and file organizations uh, through TUAD in particular. Um, which I didn't go into a great deal of uh, detail about, uh, and I'm not going to right now. But uh, Scott, you may have something to add to that. Uh, hey, Scott, do you want to jump in? Your mic is open. Scott Marshall. Can you hear me now? Yes. OK, I'm sorry. I, I had it muted on my phone. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think Carl really got at the heart of it. The, the one thing I'll say about the 60s and 70s in terms of the party uh, and its rebuilding was that one of the things that was paramount uh, was urging our young comrades to, uh, we had a policy which we called industrial concentration. And basically we were encouraging young comrades uh, to follow the lead of the comrades that had, you know, uh, fought in all of these unions, the steel unions, the auto unions, the rest of them, to get in there to continue what they had been doing. And uh, a lot of us, that's how we got involved in the labor movement and why we uh, went to try to... Uh, so anyway, the parties continued concentration on the idea that, that the working class is at the heart of the class struggle. Uh, and that it brings together the core forces in a unique mass way was something that was was developed during that whole period. Uh, I mean, we, we saw the proof, of the, the proof of the pudding of having that kind of an approach because um, we did have, as Carl said, we did start to have huge impact on the rest of the labor movement. But it came out of that idea that that's where we needed to be and that's where we wanted our young workers to, to concentrate. That's it. Thanks, Scott. Um, I'll, I'll try to answer Denny's question about the uh, anti-communist clauses in union constitutions and rules. Uh, it was something that was almost universal uh, coming out of the uh, McCarthy period, coming out of the 1950s and into the 60s. And it has been a slow struggle to remove those from various union constitutions. As a practical matter, uh, the courts have held that the provisions are not enforceable, uh, although I wouldn't bet too much about what the courts might do today. Uh, we're dealing with now increasingly with Trump's courts and uh, a contempt for uh, any kind of established uh, rules of law that have, uh, that have been in existence for the last couple of decades. Uh, I think the key thing is uh, that it's important to continue the struggle to remove those from union constitutions. Uh, what's happened uh, in the recent decades is that many of the, uh, even the top of important unions are themselves the children of uh, people who were communists and were blacklisted during the 1940s and 1950s. And as they rose to, even though they weren't communists themselves, as they rose to leadership of their unions, in many cases, they uh, took action to remove those uh, kind of pernicious clauses from the constitutions of their organizations. But it's still a fight that needs to be fight, fought. And uh, uh, you can't be complacent about it. Uh, on the other hand, it shouldn't be a bar to uh, activity by anybody. Uh, it's a fundamental assault on democratic rights. And most people will, will agree, I think, that the judgment of who should be a union member 
should not be based on their political views, but rather their activities in support of the interests of their fellow workers. Thank you. Um, we, I think uh, we have questions coming up next from, uh, I know Cindy had a question, uh, followed by Emil Skeppers and Irving Jones. Uh, Cindy, your mic is open. Oh, Cindy, are you, are you there? Yeah, I'm, yes. I'm here, I just unmuted. Um, I would like to thank you for the clarity and organization of your talk. I just think it's fantastic, particularly for me who doesn't know a lot about the um, 30s and 40s. However, I do know a lot about the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and blah, blah, blah. And so my question is, do you really feel like, can you prove to me that although the unions are smaller, that they become more, and I forget what word you used, but uh, more insistent on getting their rights? That, that one bothers me. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, our next question is from Emil. Emil, your mic is open. Thank you, thank you. Uh, first of all, Carl, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. And thank you to the Ed Department for the wonderful series of webinars, which really are a pleasure. And I hope to see this in written forms to distribute uh, widely as we can. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, could you make a comment or two on the implications, the impact rather, of the McCarthy purchase and its damage it did to the presence of communists in the labor movement on international labor solidarity, uh, including up to today. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Emil. Uh, our next question is from Irving Jones. Irving, your mic is open. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, we hear you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for the wonderful lecture. Uh, but my main question is, do you believe that even though the unions are more militant and, of course, as a result, smaller, uh, do you think there is any hope that those unions will be more willing to um, uh, organize on the basis of socialism or uh, move towards socialism? And, or, and do you believe that they will be perhaps more open to working with the World Federation of Trade Unions? Thank you very much. Uh. Okay. Uh, well, let me try to address those uh, questions. They're great questions. Um, first of all, uh, Cindy's question, uh, which was, are the unions really more militant than they were? Uh, I think there's no question that they are compared to how the labor movement was in the 1950s and the 1960s. Uh, uh, the leadership uh, has adopted a completely different tone and more to the point, uh, the role and the activity of the members within the unions has greatly increased. I think the level of democracy, uh, which is uneven from union to union, uh, I, don't, I don't want to make broad sweeping generalizations here, uh, but it's increased. Uh, the other thing that's happened that is probably as important as what the intent of the unions is, is that the uh, activities and the actions of big business in the United States have become much more aggressively anti-labor. And the workers have been forced to become more militant in order to defend themselves. Uh, sometimes the struggles are successful, sometimes they're not, but uh, there has been a great, greatly heightened awareness of the need to struggle for the interests of the workers against the big monopolies. And uh, we're even seeing this now in the increased interest in the idea of socialism in, uh, throughout the United States, the ele election of several members of Congress who proclaim themselves uh, not as communists, but to be socialists, uh, following the lead of Bernie Sanders. Uh, I think all of those are quite significant, especially since uh, the uh, we don't see what we saw in the 50s and 60s, which is that uh, political leaders who came out and called themselves socialists get red baited by the labor leadership. To the contrary, uh, 
one of the the key uh, one of the, one of the key supporters of uh, Bernie Sanders uh, campaign running for president was the recently retired head of the communications workers union um, who uh, explicitly supported Bernie Sanders call for socialism. Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, I, I think that we can really say that we're seeing a heightened level of militancy, not nearly enough, uh, not nearly consistent enough uh, from one union to another or within given unions. But it's an important shift. It's an important change. Um, the uh, the question from Emil, uh, great important question uh, about the. Uh, role of, of U.S. labor in, with respect to international labor solidarity. The international labor movement uh, has been organized into several uh, international organizations. During the period of the Cold War, uh, they took the form of two major organizations, one of which uh, included the union uh, in the socialist countries. Uh, that was the World Federation of Trade Unions. And uh, the uh, competing uh, federation, uh, the International Confederation of Trade, trade Unions, uh, which was explicitly anti-communist. And with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the World Federation has, uh, I think its influence has diminished. Uh, the number of people that it represents has diminished, but it's still an important organization. But what has happened very importantly uh, with regard to the other federation is that the militant anti-communism that characterized especially the US labor movement uh, has uh, in many ways abated. The election, which I mentioned earlier of John Sweeney to head the uh, AFL-CIO in uh, what was it, 1989, I think, uh, marked the beginning of a shift from the AFL-CIO taking a position in international labor relations of being effectively what was widely called the AFL-CIA, uh, carrying water for the uh, US government, uh, and subverting the interests of workers in other countries to uh, becoming much more inclined towards labor solidarity. And just uh, one you know, little il illustration, I was on an uh, international delegation um, of, uh, in uh, a particular industry, uh, and I was on, in another country, and uh, our guide was the representative in that country of the AFL-CIO. The ringtone on his cell phone was the opening bars of the international. Uh, it's hard to imagine that would have happened during the 1950s. So uh, things are changing. Uh, it's not universal, but uh, but I think, uh, and, and we see the, the outstanding uh, activities of a couple of unions in particular. Uh, the Steelworkers Union uh, played a tremendous role in solidarity with the Mexican Miners Union, uh, protecting that union, giving refuge uh, and support to their leadership while they were under legal attack in Mexico. Finally, with the latest presidential election in Mexico, the president of the Mexican Miners Union, uh, which is referred to as Los Mineros, uh, has been able to return home and resume the uh, leadership in his own country of this very important union in large part thanks to the efforts of the United Steelworkers Union. So uh, that's just you know one of many examples I think that could be brought up. Um, Irving asked the question, is there hope that unions will move more towards socialism? Uh, I think that is not on the short-term agenda. Uh, that the, the primary uh, purpose of unions as perceived by the U.S. labor movement is to further the Im immediate interests, uh, economic, social, uh, political, of their members and of the working class. Uh, the labor movement still in this country lacks a really broad, uh, what we would call a, a Marxist kind of analysis. So no, I don't think that's on the near-term agenda. 
but I think that to criticize uh, and to be negative towards the labor movement because of that shortcoming uh, is itself short-sighted. Uh, I think it's something to work for. It's something to build, but it has to come from the bottom up. Uh, it's not something that we should wait around for the leaders of the unions to proclaim that they have embraced the idea of socialism. Uh, it's, uh, they'll embrace the idea of socialism when their members demand that they do. And uh, so the job of progressive people, including communists, is to work to advance the ideas of social change, including socialism, among the rank and file in the labor movement. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we are uh, drawing short on time here. I know there are a number of other questions, uh, so I do uh, apologize to, to those of you that we can't call on. Uh, the video of this class will soon be posted on the uh, Communist Party's website, cpusa.org, and will be shared on the Communist Party's Facebook page. So we hope that you will uh, bring your questions there and, and that we can continue this uh, discussion. Um, thank you Scott, again. Could Carl. I make a couple? Oh, sure. Yes. Um, uh, Scott, jump in. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I, I just wanted to respond to a couple of things real quick. Um, I uh, I think people should know that the AFL-CIO took the anti-communist language out of their constitution um, way back in under uh, um, way back way back in the in the nineties, and a lot of unions have followed suit with that. And I think we should know that. I think it's a minority of unions now that have that kind of language still in their contracts. Um, and AFGE, I think you can see uh, why that uh, still can be a problem there. But anyway, I just wanted to say that because I know um, I know for the steelworkers, when we took it out, uh, the, the, the really hilarious thing was that the convention that we took it out of, um, a couple of us were handing out the Daily World, and when when the when the um, audience started coming out. These guys started saying, boy, you guys are quick. We just took it out of the Constitution. And here you are with the paper. Come on, give them to us. We'll help them hand them out. I mean, it was that kind of a celeb celebratory thing. I mean, they, so there, I think there's a lot of progress in that. I just want to say on the question of international trade unionism, I think there's a very big thing developing. And the, the steel workers and uh, the, the Los Mineros and a bunch of other unions um, around the world have joined into a new federation called Industrial. And Industrial is uh, actually more than just a federation in the sense of bringing a bunch of unions together. It's a federation based on the idea that the only way you're gonna confront capitalist globalization, corporate globalization, is to have, is to be able to unite along the supply chain for each industry. And so, Therefore, for example, Industrial has helped organize several unions of rubber workers in Africa. It's, um, it's, it, it's really concentrated on, you know, the steel workers is now the rubber workers also. It's concentrated on following rubber all the way from the time that it's pulled off to the time that it's grown all the way till it gets into the tires and stuff like that. And their idea is that's the only way that the working class, that the that the global working class is going to be able to take on um, ca uh, corporate capitalism. And I think that's a, a really important development. And lastly, on the thing for socialism in the labor movement, um, yeah, Carl's absolutely right. And it is coming from the ground up. It's just amazing to me uh, how many people, um, you know, will, in, in the course of my work in the labor movement, which is predominantly with retirees and for the FLCIO and for the um, steel workers, all of these people who say, oh yeah, oh you're a communist, yeah, um, you know, I read this book, it's really good. I think, uh, you know, I, I, I wanna hear what you have to say. Um, those kind of things go on and, and some people tell me, yeah, I've been a communist all my life. I say, oh yeah, oh, how's that? Said, oh, I read the book and I thought it was good. Um, and the last thing I wanna say is just a, um, uh, kind of fits in this, and I can't wholeheartedly say it's perfect, but there is a new book out that some parts of the labor movement are pushing, and it's called Can the Working Class Change the World? 
and it's by a guy named Michael Yates. And I've just started reading it, and his whole argument is about how the only way to solve the problems uh, that face the working class, the only way to save the working class is to move towards socialism. And just so you know, this wasn't, I, I first heard about this book uh, because the United Electrical Workers um, newsletter had a, had a thing in it, hey, everybody, you should read this book. That's really cool. So anyway, I, I, I would urge people to read it. I think, I think it, from, from what I can judge of the first part that I've read, it's Marxism, but it's Marxism in modern language without all the jargon. And I think that's extremely useful in this day and age. Okay, that's it. Sorry. Thank you, Scott. Uh, all right. Um, thank you all again for uh, joining us tonight. Um, thanks to Carl uh, Wood and Scott Marshall. Uh, and um, stay tuned. There will be um, more uh, forthcoming from the Marxist classes uh, pretty soon. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Dee, do you have anything? I'm here. Um, there will be a number of different, the, the CPUSA will open its uh, pre-convention discussion period in February, uh, which is next month. Um, and you're all invited to participate in the various activities uh, that will uh, go out uh, uh, um, soon. So uh, stay tuned to uh, cpusa.org for uh, more updates on uh, upcoming activities. Thank you and good night. Good night, Thank you, everyone.